Hoke handed Vietnam veteran Staff Sergeant John, Four Leaf, Tabak's memoir, Tropic Thunder, is being made into a film. With the exception of newcomer supporting actor Kevin Sandusky, the cast, fading action hero Tug Speedman, overbearing five-time Academy Award-winning Australian method actor Kirk Lazarus, loudmouth rapper Al Pacino, and drug-addicted comedian Jeff Portnoy, all cause problems for the inexperienced director Damien Coburn, who cannot control them, resulting in a million-dollar pyrotechnic scene being wasted. With the project months behind schedule, studio executive Les Grossman gives Damien an ultimatum, get the cast under control or the project will be cancelled. On Four Leafs' advice, Damien drops the actors into the middle of the jungle, with hidden cameras and rigged special effects explosions to film guerrilla style. The actors have guns that fire blanks, along with a map and scene listing that will lead to a helicopter waiting at the end of the route. Unknown to the actors and production, the group have been dropped in the middle of the Golden Triangle, the home of the heroin-producing Flaming Dragon Gang. Just as the group is about to set off, Damien inadvertently steps on an old land mine and is blown up, stunning the actors. Tug, believing Damien faked his death to encourage the cast to give better performances, assures the others that Damien is alive, and that they are still shooting the film. Kirk is unconvinced but joins them in their trek through the jungle just to get out of the jungle. When Four Leaf and Pyrotechnics operator Cody Underwood try to locate the deceased director, they are captured by Flaming Dragon. Four Leaf is revealed to have hands, he confesses to Underwood that he actually served in the Coast Guard, has never left the United States, and that he wrote his memoir as a tribute. As the actors continue through the jungle, Kirk, who has become convinced that Tug's ineptitude is putting them in jeopardy, and Kevin, the only actor who bothered to properly prepare for his role, discover that Tug is leading them in the wrong direction. The resulting argument results in Kirk leading the rest of the cast back toward the resort they are staying at as an increasingly delirious Tug is captured by Flaming Dragon. Taken to their base, Tug believes it is a prisoner of war camp from the script. The gang discovers he is the star of their favorite film, the box office bomb Simple Jack, and force him to reenact it several times a day, leading him to become brainwashed. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, Tug's agent Rick Pecker Peck confronts Les over an unfulfilled term in Tug's contract that entitles him to a TiVo. Flaming Dragon calls during the discussion and demands a ransom for Tug, but Les instead delivers a profanity-laden death threat. Les is uninterested in rescuing Tug and is instead delighted at the prospect of a large insurance payout if Tug dies. He attempts to convince Pecker to play along by promising a Gulfstream V jet and lots of money. Kurt, Kalpa, Jeff, and Kevin discover Flaming Dragon's heroin factory. After witnessing Tug being tortured, they plan a rescue attempt based on the film script. Kirk impersonates a farmer towing a captured Jeff on the back of a water buffalo, distracting the armed guard so Alpa and Kevin can infiltrate and find the prisoners. But a combination of broken Mandarin Chinese and inconsistencies in his story sets off the gang's boss. The actors, knowing their cover has been blown, begin firing, fooling the gang members into surrender. Their control of the gang falls apart when Jeff grabs the leader and heads for the drugs, and the gang, realizing the gun's fire blanks, recover their guns and fight back. The four actors locate Four Leaf, Cody, and Tug and cross a bridge rig to explode to get to Underwood's helicopter. Tug initially remains behind, believing Flaming Dragon to be his family, but runs back screaming, chased by an angry whore. Four Leaf destroys the bridge, rescuing Tug. But as the helicopter takes off, the gang boss fires an RPG at the helicopter. Rick unexpectedly stumbles out of the jungle and saves them by throwing a TiVo box into the path of the grenade. 
The crew returned to Hollywood and footage from the hidden cameras is compiled into the feature film Tropic Blunder, which becomes a major critical and commercial success. The film wins Tuggy's first Academy Award, which Kirk presents to him at the ceremony. In London, longtime friends and small time criminals Eddie, Tom, Soap, and Bacon put together £100,000 so that Eddie, a genius card sharp, can buy into one of Hatchet Harry Lonsdale's high stakes three card brag games. The game is rigged and the friends end up owing Harry £500,000. Harry then sends his debt collector Big Chris, who is often accompanied by his son, Little Chris, to ensure that the debt is paid within a week. Harry is also interested in a pair of expensive antique shotguns that are up for auction and gets his enforcer Barry the Baptist to hire a pair of thieves, Gary and Dean, to steal them from a bankrupt lord. The two turn out to be highly incompetent and unwittingly sell the shotguns to Nick the Greek, a local fence. Barry threatens the two into getting the guns back. Eddie returns home one day and overhears his neighbors, a gang of robbers led by a brutal man called Dog planning a heist on some cannabis growers loaded with cash and drugs. Eddie relays this information to the group, intending for them to rob the neighbors as they return from their heist. Preparing for the robbery, Tom visits Nick the Greek to buy weapons and ends up buying the two antique shotguns. The neighbor's heist gets underway and despite a gang member being killed by his own brand gun and an incriminating encounter with a traffic warden, they succeed returning home with a duffel bag full of money and a van loaded with bags of cannabis. Eddie and his friends ambush them as planned and drive away in the neighbor's van containing the marijuana and the traffic warden. They transfer the loot to their own van and return home. They then have Nick fence the drugs to Rory Breaker, a gangster with a violent reputation. Rory agrees to buy the cannabis at half price but two of Rory's men visit the house of the cannabis growers discover they've been robbed and the cannabis he just bought had been stolen from his own growers. Rory threatens Nick into giving him Eddie's address and tasks one of the growers, Winston, to identify the robbers. Eddie and his friends spend the night at Eddie's father's bar to celebrate. Dog's crew accidentally learns that their neighbors robbed them and set up an ambush in Eddie's flat. Rory and his gang arrive instead and in an ensuing shootout, all except Dog and Winston are killed. Winston leaves with the drugs, while Dog leaves with the two shotguns and the money but is waylaid by Big Chris, who incapacitates him and takes everything. Gary and Dean, having learned who bought the shotguns and unaware that Chris works for Harry, follow Chris to Harry's place. Chris delivers the money and guns to Harry but when he returns to his car he finds Dog holding little Chris at knife point, demanding the money be returned to him. Chris complies and starts the car. Gary and Dean burst into Harry's office, starting a confrontation that ends up killing them both along with Harry and Barry. Returning to see the carnage at their flat and their loot missing, Eddie and his friends head to Harry's but upon discovering Harry's corpse, they decide to take the money for themselves. Before they are able to leave, Chris crashes into their car to disable Dog and then bludgeons him to death with his car door. He then takes the debt money back from the unconscious friends but allows Tom to leave with the antique shotguns after a brief standoff in Harry's office. The friends are arrested but soon acquitted after the traffic warden identifies Dog and his crew as the culprits. Back at the bar, they send Tom out to dispose of the antique shotguns, the only remaining evidence linking them to the case. Chris then arrives to give back the duffel bag, from which he has taken all the money for himself and his son and which is empty except for a catalog of antique weapons. Leafing through the catalog, the friends learn that the shotguns are actually quite valuable worth £250,000 to £300,000, and quickly call Tom to stop him from disposing of the guns. The film ends with Tom leaning over a bridge, with his mobile phone in his mouth and ringing, as he prepares to drop the shotguns into the River Thames. Faced with a demotion, Osborne Cox angrily quits his job as a CIA analyst and decides to write a memoir. When his pediatrician wife Katie finds out, she sees it as an opportunity to file for divorce and to continue an affair with Harry Farrar, a married U.S. Marshal with paranoid tendencies. 
At the instruction of her lawyer, Katie copies and delivers her husband's digital financial records and other files, unknowingly including the draft of Ozzy's memoir. The lawyer's assistant copies the files onto a CD, which she accidentally leaves on the locker room floor of Hardbodies, a local gym. The disc falls into the hands of personal trainer Chad Feldheimer and his co-worker Linda Litz, who mistakenly believe it to contain sensitive government information. Chad devises a plan to return the disc to Osborne Cox for a cash reward, with Linda eager to raise money for cosmetic surgery that she cannot afford. After a phone call and unsuccessful meeting provoke Cox, Chad and Linda try to sell the disc to the Russian embassy, meeting with an official who is actually a spy for the CIA. Osborne's erratic behavior prompts Katie to change the locks on their house and to invite Harry to move in. Harry is a womanizer and routinely dates and sleeps with women whom he has met online. He coincidentally starts seeing Linda after meeting her on a dating site. Having promised the Russians more files, Linda persuades Chad to sneak into the Cox house to steal files from Osborne's computer. But this attempt ends in Chad's discovery by Harry, who shoots him in the head, killing him instantly. Harry searches the body for any clues to Chad's identity, but only finds an empty wallet. He surmises that Chad was a spook. At CIA headquarters, Osborne's former superior and a director learn that information from Osborne has been given to the Russian embassy, and are perplexed because the information is of no importance and the perpetrator's motive is unknown. A spy assigned to watch Harry observed him dumping Chad's body into Chesapeake Bay. Unaware of Chad's identity, the director orders Chad's death to be covered up. After finding the cars following him to be driven by a divorce lawyer hired by his wife, a depressed Harry meets with Linda, and after hearing her distress at her friend Chad going missing, Harry agrees to help find him, unaware that Chad is the man whom he had shot and killed. Linda returns to the embassy, believing that the Russians have abducted Chad, but they deny that they have him. After they inform her the contents of the CD she has given them are worthless, she convinces the manager of Hard Bodies, Ted, who has unrequited feelings for Linda, to help her by sneaking into the Cox household to gather more files. Harry and Linda meet in a park, where Linda reveals the address where Chad had gone before disappearing. Harry realizes that Chad is the man whom he had shot, is convinced that Linda is a spy, and flees, panicking. When Osborne breaks into Katie's house to retrieve personal belongings, he finds Ted in the basement. Osborne shoots him, chases him into the street, and kills him with a hatchet. The film cuts to the CIA headquarters, where a discussion between Osborne's former superior and the director reveals that a surveilling CIA officer intervened, shooting Osborne and leaving him in a coma. He also says that Harry has been detained while trying to flee to Venezuela, a country with no extradition treaty with the US. The director orders to let Harry continue on to Venezuela rather than deal with the consequences of bringing him into custody. They also reveal that Linda has been captured but has agreed to keep quiet if they will pay for her plastic surgery. The director, confused at the events that have transpired, approves payment for Linda's surgeries, and closes the file containing the events of the film.